Hello, I'm Virginia Maximowitz. I'm excited to be showing at the Rowan University Art Gallery and Museum in Glassboro, New Jersey. And I'd like to take you on a virtual tour of this exhibition. The Lightness of Bearing. Where does the title come from? You might be familiar with the late Milan Kundera's book, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, its philosophical concept which assumes that everything in the universe repeats in a like fashion over and over throughout time, resonates well with what I'm trying to show in my work. The obvious pun of the title is a double entendre. It also refers to the architectural form of the caryatid. Caryatids are female forms that act as weight-bearing columns, but that appear effortless in doing so. What do I want you to learn during this walkthrough of the exhibition? That this show is a visual investigation of women's bodies, architecture, and mythology. And that I've embedded many clues, or dots, in the work that you can find if you look closely and apply your individual perceptions and experiences. So let's go through the exhibit together. I'm not going to tell you what I think each piece means but I will connect a few of the dots for you. I'll relate a few anecdotes about how I made the work, and I'll refer to a few questions that were posed by Andrea Kirsch in the essay she wrote for the exhibition catalog. As we virtually enter Rowan's High Street Gallery and pan across the space, you can see first a group of silk pairings I call comparisons. You can also see others in the background, and might notice that there are two different versions, five pairings that are overlapping, two that are side by side. The overlapping ones use two different types of silk, a thin translucent chiffon in the front and a more opaque twill in the back. This one places an architectural detail from a building in Lecce, Italy, over a woman in a procession in Tomor, Portugal. Notice how the key alignment between the two images is of the faces. Around the corner is a sculpture called Zitcha, which means life in Ukrainian. The overall form may suggest a fountain, but it's wheat that's gushing from the top, and acanthus leaves are pouring down from the sides. Wheat and acanthus are extremely important plants and symbols in many cultures, and you'll find them represented in many of the works in this show. Turning to the left, there are two more comparisons. What is the Ghanaian woman carrying on her head? Why is she paired with a column that looks like baskets? I hope that you will see a connection with the form of Zitcha. The comparison on the right pairs a folk statue of a woman carrying a basket with a canaphora in the Vatican Museums. Canaphorae are caryatid light figures who carry baskets of produce on their heads. I'll say more about caryatids soon. What kind of basket-like forms are stacked here? Why are they forming a column? And why are there plaster sculptures of bread spilling out onto the floor? Why are those tiny angels hiding in there? This sculpture is called Panis Angelicus. Anyone brought up Roman Catholic in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, like I was, will immediately recognize this Latin phrase meaning bread of angels. But what dots have I placed into this sculpture for you to connect? First of all, the basket-like forms are actually architectural Corinthian-style capitals, which are usually on tops of columns. These capitals are always decorated with the leaves of the acanthus plant. Where did this style come from? We don't really know, but the first century BC architectural writer Vitruvius theorized that its origin came from a basket placed upon a maiden's grave. It was filled with the things she loved in life, and a stone was placed on top of it for protection. Eventually, acanthus grew up around the basket. Like kudzu in our area, which grows with wild abandon, Acanthus in the Mediterranean climate is extremely fecund. It really wants to live, so it's become a symbol of life. 
Where else in the show have you seen similar leaves? Maybe you'll recall Zitcha, and that its title means life in Ukrainian. And turning back to classical mythology, just who was that maiden upon whose grave the acanthus entwined basket was placed? An essay in Joseph Reichert's book, The Dancing Column, posits that it was Persephone. Abducted by Hades to the underworld, she returns every spring to her mother, Demeter, the goddess of grain. Often called the staff of life, wheat is a long-standing symbol of fertility, bounty, and resurrection. Bread, in many religions, especially the Abrahamic ones, not only sustains physical life, it sustains spiritual life. In ancient times, in the most climactic moment of the Eleusinian mysteries, a single grain of wheat was displayed for contemplation in complete silence before it was planted, buried. Just as Demeter was reunited with her daughter Persephone, perhaps the wheat and wheat berries incorporated into Zitcha can evoke in this painful moment the eventual reuniting the bread basket of Europe centered on Ukraine with those who depend upon it for sustenance. Sculptures of stone and women of flesh in words and pictures, literally and metaphorically, imprinted on fragile simulacra of books and balanced on precarious pedestals. This describes my work, Caryatids in Five Books. The dots I ask you to connect can be found by reading the verses by Romanian poet Cristina Monica Moldovenu. Note once again the figure of the Caryatid. When I was little, I sculpted in chalk a girl's body. On the blackboard, children were writing perfect mathematical equations. I hid my doll in my pocket, playing hopscotch over the shadow of a thin birch. Snowstorms covered school windows, old silvery branches bowed again, white lines were swept away. My small statue stayed the same, sustaining on a bookshelf some yellow-tinged photographs. As we move past more of the comparisons, I offer you other dots to connect. A Russian woman in blue at a bread and salt welcoming ceremony superimposed upon a caryatid-like figure holding bread at the Angel of Peace Monument in Munich. A Lenape woman named Susie Elker of the Delaware tribe next to a column from a French monastery that is now at the Cloisters in New York City. Unlike the previous comparisons, these do not overlap, but are presented in juxtaposition. How do they relate? I invite you to look at the postures, the zigzags, the headdresses, and the column capital. Behind them is a series of drawings that I call bearers. All of these figures bear weights of some sort, and some are, yes, caryatids. Caryatids are specifically the female figures that act as structural columns in architecture. The most famous of these are the ones at the Erechtheion Temple in Athens. This drawing was made from a reproduction of one of them at Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli near Rome. Coming back to the historian Vitruvius, according to him, the Erechtheion figures represent the women of Caryae who were doomed to hard labor because the town sided with the Persians during an invasion of Greece. However, I don't think Vitruvius was using his eyes. Does she look like she's struggling? These women are strong, and they bear their load with grace. In recent years, scholars, many of them women, have begun to connect the dots and to question this interpretation. As the English art historian Dorothy King, also known as the P.H. Diva, points out, caryatids never express the burden of their supporting function. The Erechtheon maidens, for example, have one bent and one relaxed leg. And I especially like the title of Camille Paglia's 2012 article about the Erechtheon caryatids, Six Headstrong Women confidently raise Acropolis roof. 
It's more likely that the word caryatid is derived from the cult of Artemis Caryatis at Eleusis, the temple of Demeter. Artemis and Persephone were half-sisters, both of them daughters of Demeter. Turning to the left of the bearers, you can see more drawings, but also another comparison. This time, a ball-topped column is paired with a Zuni woman carrying a water jug. I hope that you will look, of course, at the spherical shapes of the ball and the bowl, but that you will also look at the stance of the woman, her cloak concealing her body, erect as a column. I promised you anecdotes, so here goes. At the end of 2019, my husband and I went to Buenos Aires for the first time. I knew that the city had some amazing architecture and we spent a lot of time walking around and photographing. Looking up, we realized that we were being watched. There were faces everywhere, not always, but for the most part, women's faces in high relief sculptures on the facades of buildings. We then met up with our friend, the architectural historian and writer, Sergio Kiernan. When he found out we were photographing those faces, he said he wanted to give us something. It was a book he had published through the Historical Society that documented these faces, for which the architectural term is mascarone. What he discovered while researching these mascarones was that they were not generic faces, but instead portraits of particular women, most likely the wives and daughters of architects and builders. In March 2020, COVID shut down everything. Back home in Philadelphia, I couldn't access my sculpture studio and we were confined to our house. I found myself drawn to and drawing these figures, whom I see as protective of those who pass beneath, like a mother hen hovering over her chicks. And what does mascarone actually mean? Large mask. How appropriate for a pandemic artwork. As well, there's a short video that gives a sense of how ingrained, pun intended, everything I've been talking about is in folk traditions. Around the corner to the right is my installation, The Architecture of Memory, which was visible in the initial pan of the gallery from the entrance. In terms of the dots metaphor, I can say that this piece is about my not being able to connect the dots. In preparing for this show, I was invited to tour the university's Holly Bush Mansion, a historic building that had once been the home of the glass manufacturing magnate Thomas Whitney. As I walked through the house, I was amazed at the Italianate ornamentation, especially the acanthus fill cornices. Imagining a potential piece about the house, I asked if I could make silicone molds of them. But to my delight, it turned out that during the mansion's extensive restoration process, molds had already been taken. The university graciously lent them to me, and I began casting these acanthus leaves into a type of hard plaster called hydrostone. Intrigued by Holly Bush's history, I began researching the Whitney family. Given the focus on women-related imagery that I knew this exhibition would have, I was especially interested in learning more about Thomas Whitney's wife, Josephine, who resided in the house for almost her entire life. To my surprise, I ran pretty much into a dead end. While I could easily locate information about Thomas, his brothers, his mother, and even his extended family, it was as if Josephine never existed. Basic internet searches could not find birth or death dates, nor even a place of burial. Sometimes her name was misspelled. Sometimes there were contradictory results. A vintage newspaper obituary announced her passing, but was wrong about her age. I couldn't find even one photograph. Both the university and the local historical society had only minimal information. The one or two sentences about Josephine that did appear in a couple of publications gave few facts about this woman's life.
What became clear to me was that my attempt to piece together the details of Josephine Allen Whitney's story was akin to what the Hollybush restorers had done, piece together and make sense of the rubble of the mansion's history. I now saw Hollybush as a metaphorical container for memories and for a woman's life lived inside those walls. Some of the questions that Andrea Kirsch asked in her catalog essay for this exhibition come to mind. Looking at this pile of rubble on a rug, we can ask, whom do we choose to memorialize? What is preserved when we restore historical buildings? Do buildings have their own ghosts? How do we make sense of such fragments and what is left out? Let me close by leading you into the hallway. There is one more artwork called Garden of Earthly Delights. It's the oldest piece in the show made in 1998. I wanted to include it because it planted the seeds for my continued interest in architectural ornamentation and figuration. It was made for the Bolin Art Gallery, which no longer exists, at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia. The room's gray walls were filled with ornamental molding. Painters absolutely hated showing there because it was nearly impossible to hang canvases in that space. I took on the challenge and created this piece using casts of architectural medallions. I offer you more dots to connect. The casts of a woman's face, and that face is my own, casts of fruit and vegetables, and words often used to describe both. Garden is made entirely out of cotton paper pulp, a material that appears to be very fragile but is in fact quite durable. I hope you've all enjoyed this walkthrough.